Otto, thank you for that lovely introduction. Shio Nagada Kuali Dawado, Hialieli Ani Awiahi Elo, Wado University of Wollongong, Ale Brahman Carlson, Ale Andre Farrell, Ale Nagad, Nudele Yawi. Hello, everyone. My name is Kuali, and uh, I want to say thank you to the indigenous people whose, whose land we're on. And, for allowing us to um, be here, and to Bronwyn Carlson and Andrew Farrell and everyone he, who invited me here and, and got me here. Um, it truly is an honor and very humbling. And I also want to ask forgiveness from the elders here today if I should misstep in following any protocols here, and thank you for your work and wisdom. I speak Cherokee like a three-year-old, because like most Cherokees, I didn't grow up speaking our language. And I want to say that I'm grateful to my Cherokee language teacher, Bo Taylor, and any mistakes are my own. I weave baskets. Mostly I weave the double wall baskets that are closely associated with Cherokees from Oklahoma. But I also weave our old southeastern style of double woven river cane baskets and coiled baskets. I'm not an expert weaver and still have a lot to learn. How to gather materials for weaving, how to process cane, how to weave other styles of baskets that are now part of Cherokee weaving traditions. I share this because weaving deeply informs my theorizing about Cherokee two-spirit and queer memories and histories, and has become my guiding metaphor for thinking about the ways in which Cherokee two-spirit and queer people are reimagining our pasts and futures through restorying in the present. By restorying, I mean retelling and imagining of stories that restores and continues cultural memories. Chicana scholar Casey C. Cobos theorizes what she calls embodied storytelling, the ways in which Chicanas continue indigenous life ways through embodied practices, and writes that embodying storying, quote, requires interrogating ways that history and the archive have acted upon indigenous bodies and looking for ways that this can be countered by retelling stories, end quote. Miami scholar Malia Powell begins her scholarship, This is a Story, reminding us that theory and scholarship are always, quote, stories about how the world works and that we are part of a mar much larger, more complicated accumulation of stories, end quote. Powell and other women of color feminists refuse the separation between theory, poetry, art, and other forms of expression. My work is an accumulation of stories and a reimagining of stories through scholarship, poetry, and performance, and hopes to create new stories for Cherokee Two-Spirit people and larger indigenous queer movements and communities, a restorying. And this reminds me of a story. I'm in Peterborough, Ontario, studying at the summer workshop for the Center for Indigenous Theater. All day long, we work intensely on an original performance. At night, I spend a lot of time weaving baskets that I want to give to the ensemble and directors at the end of our three weeks together. As I weave, I think about the performance work we are doing, as well as the scholarship I'm pursuing on Cherokee Two-Spirit people and Cherokee performance rhetorics for my dissertation. And as I weave these small double-woven baskets, I realize that I can press cedar against the inner wall of the basket and weave over the fresh green sprigs with the outer wall so that the cedar can't be seen. But as the person weaving the basket, I know it's there. This story is a brief moment, but one that is central to my theorizing about Cherokee Two-Spirit memory. It was through the physical process of weaving baskets that I realized that double wall and double woven baskets create a third space between the basket walls. In the decolonial imaginary, writing Chicanas into history, Emma Perez writes, quote, I believe that the time lag between the colonial and the post-colonial can be conceptualized as the decolonial imaginary, end quote. 
She theorizes the decolonial as a rupturing space, the alternative to that which is written history, and that space where differential politics and social dilemmas are negotiated. She continues, if the colonial imaginary hides a something, then the decolonial imaginary, teetering in a third space, recognizes what is left out. Chicana theories have done major work in theorizing decolonial politics and complex relationships between gender, sexuality, colonialism, and nation are therefore fruitful places from which to think deeply about indigenous two-spirit decolonization. The theoretical and methodological underpinnings of this work draw from numerous activist, artistic, and intellectual genealogies, what Maori scholar Linda Tui Smith calls descent lines. These descent lines include Cherokee traditions, other indigenous traditions, women of color feminisms, grassroots activisms, queer and trans studies and politics, poetry, indigenous studies, and decolonial politics. I conceive these descent lines as splints of cane that are double woven in order to create a basket to carry these stories. And so my talk today weaves back and forth between scholarship and poetry and if we have time, maybe a little performance, intentionally disrupting colonial categories of how we do this work. A poem, Map of the Americas. I wish when we touch, we could transcend history in double helixes of dark and light on wings we build ourselves. But this land grows volcanic from the smoldering hum of bones, all that's left of men who watched beloveds torn apart by rifles, grandmothers singing back lost families, children who didn't live long enough to cradle a lover, arms around waist, lips gently skimming nape, legs twined together like a river cane basket. Sometimes I look at you and choke back sobs, knowing you are here because so many of my people are not. Look, my body curled and asleep becomes a map of the Americas. My hair spread upon the pillow, a landscape of ice. My chest, the plains and hills of this land. My spine, the continental divide. My heart drums the rhythm of returning buffalo herds. Do you notice the deserts and green mountains on my belly's topography? Or the way my hips rise like ancient pyramids, my legs wrapped with the Amazon, the Andes, the Pampas, the vast roads of the Incas? Here are rainforests, highlands, stolen breath trapped deep in mine shafts, and my feet that reach to touch Antarctica. When your hands travel across my hemispheres, know these lands have been invaded before. And though I may quiver from your touch, there is still a war. It is not without fear and memories awash in blood that I allow you to slip between my borders, rest in the warm valleys of my sovereign body, offer you feasts and songs, dress you in a cloak of peacock feathers and stars. These gifts could be misconstrued as worship, honor mistaken for surrender. When you taste my lips, think of maize, venison, perfect wild strawberries. Notice the way my breath smells of cedar and my sweat flows like slow southern rivers and my flesh burns with history. Honor this. I walk out of genocide to touch you. The term two-spirit is a contemporary term being used in indigenous North American communities to describe someone whose gender exists outside of colonial logic. It is an umbrella term that re references indigenous traditions for people who don't fit into rigid gender categories. It also, depending on the context, refers to indigenous people who identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer. There are several ways to describe two-spirit people in Cherokee and the diversity uh, reflects the limits of any umbrella term in English. So these are just a few, and, and I also want to say that uh, in Cherokee, these are descriptive, they're not categories. So, Ashkayust Udanti, they feel like a man. 
I get used to Dante, they feel like a woman. Nudala egeya udante di, different spirited woman. Nudale ashgaya udante di, different spirited man. Shkigi, that way. Ulgish di degi, flirt. Talikwo di dantan, he or she has two hearts. Uccelira, special. Nudale udanto, different heart or spirit. Achoni e acho ine she or he is third as in gender and asegi udanto strange heart and spirit it is this final term that i would like to look to as a critical apparatus from which to launch both a critique of colonial heteropatriarchy as well as begin to reimagine the histories of cherokee gender and sexuality Asegi udanto refers specifically to people who fall out either outside of men's and women's roles or who mix men's and women's roles. Asegi, which means strange, is also being used by some Cherokees as a term similar to queer. Asegi provides a mean by which to reread Cherokee history in order to listen for those stories rendered strange by colonial heteropatriarchy. Asegi stories are the other stories, the strange and queer stories that are told in the absent presence of two spirit people and same gender loving people in both archival and embodied memories. They are the stories that Cherokee two spirit people tell each other in order to revise cultural memories. They are the stories hidden between the basket walls. And it is through the retelling and reimagining of these Asegi stories that we can work to place gender and sexuality at the center of radical decolonial work. Indigenous queer and feminist scholarship intervenes into colonial ways scholarship is done by insisting on centralizing an analysis of ongoing settler colonialism and resistance to it and heteropatriarchy as an entwined project of oppression and control. What scholars, activists, and artists are arguing is that homophobia, heterosexism, misogyny, and gender binaries are central to the invasion and occupation of indigenous lands and the marginalization, genocide, and oppression of indigenous peoples. Resistance, then, must centralize gender and sexuality as a central site of radical social transformation. The purpose of this work is in, to encourage decolonial activisms through shifting our forms of analysis across disciplines and across the perceived divide between grassroots activism and academic spaces in order to centralize a critique of the ways heteropatriarchy is used as a form of settler colonial violence. Andrea Smith argues that heteropatriarchy is the basis from which settler colonialism and white supremacy are built. And activist groups such as the Native Youth Sexual Health Network and the Walking With Our Sisters Project in Canada are bringing attention to how heteropatriarchy, misogyny, and gender binaries continue to be used as tools of settlement, assimilation, and genocide. Colonization has always used our genders and sexualities as a reason to attack, enslave, or civilize us. The word gender itself is from the Latin genus, a species, sort, kind, and related to the word genre. Gender is a logic and a structural system of oppression that sole purpose is to categorize people in order to deploy systemic power and control. It is a wholly co colonial imposition. This doesn't mean I think that our identities as men, as women, as queer, as trans people are some kind of false colonial consciousness. I do think, though, that gender as a concept, um, and I'm specifically using language in English, is a weapon to force us into clear Eurocentric categories, keep us confined there, ensure we monitor each other's behavior, and then, while we are distracted, take our lands. So this poem that I'm about to read requires some context. In 1830, President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act, which forcibly removed indigenous people east of the Mississippi to Indian territory in what is now the state of Oklahoma. Cherokees call this removal the Trail of Tears, and by conservative estimates, a quarter of our nation 
died or was killed during the removal. Our wave of removal started in 1838. This poem is called Love Poems, 1838 to 1839, Tennessee. What was left behind? Love formulas written in dark syllables whose incantations undulated like our tongues. Did you know they tried to erase you? Forbade me to speak your name. My arms muscled rivers you came to each morning. After they seized you, they told me not to touch anyone again. Rows of corn, ears swaying slightly on their stalks, pumpkins thick with flesh, tomatoes swollen with juice so acidic they could blister your lips. Did you know when you left, they drank every drop? A quilt appliqued with stars so you could remember the birth of the Milky Way. Or was it a map, coded, to find your way back to me? What was left behind? Corn, tongues, scraps of stars, words, and your body's silhouette scratched forever into me. Indian Territory. I know you were driven away, taken from everything that taught you love. I don't expect you to forget, only to love me as well. Love me. Love the winding trails to my belly, the valleys at my sternum, the way I slope towards you like promise. Who comforted you as you hugged knees to your bruised body? Who laid you down, covered you with kisses as you cried, my bones shriek like trains filled with nations? Who held you as you convulsed, my body is an open-mouthed moan? Who gave your body? back to you. Hush, this is home now. You are home. You are home. Like the concept of gender, the idea of sexuality, which is dependent on the idea of gender, is simply another way to sort people into genres of behavior, desire, and identity in order to exert power and control. The idea of sexual orientation too often hides the fact that most people experience desire and sex outside of gender and sexual binaries. These colonial logics mean that when we look to our past, we straighten it. We make heterosexist and gender binary assumptions about our ancestors and render a more complicated, erotic, and joyous history invisible. How am I doing on time? Doing good? Okay. So I want to share with you an excerpt from an ongoing oral history performance project uh, with other Cherokee queer and two-spirit people because these interviews um, really inform my understanding and a lot of the things I'm talking about. And I'm, I'm sharing these not as like um, an ethnographic project. I'm sharing them because these are the stories that people are telling each other. And I love these stories. So I'm going to just share one. Um, and this is from Corey Tabor, who's a Cherokee Creek and Osage Two-Spirit activist. And I can answer questions about this larger performance project later if you'd like. My brother Chad and I were born and raised in Tulsa. Our parents were also born and raised in Tulsa and our grandparents come from a few different places. Our dad's mom is Cherokee and Creek and she comes from down by Muskogee and his dad was white and also comes from that same area. Our mom's mom is Cherokee and Wajaje. She's a mixed race individual. And she comes from Arkansas, Western Arkansas and her dad was white and comes from Tulsa. So we've got family from a few different places but all within maybe a two hour drive from Tulsa. Regionally, I guess you could say it's all about the same. Our parents had us when they were pretty young and so they worked, you know? And we spent all our time around all these old ladies. And it was kind of by default and kind of by tradition. That's pretty standard. That's an old tradition. It's how it used to be. The whole rest of the family would take care of these kids. That would be the elders and other community members. 
And that's just a natural way for us to live. Our family is not extremely traditional like most Cherokee families, especially those who live in cities by relocation or choice or, or force or whatever. And so while we did not grow up speaking Cherokee as a first language or did not necessarily grow up spending every weekend at the stomp dance, we grew up with a lot of traditional understandings and traditional knowledge and life ways that I think maybe other people don't, especially when they're not close to their elders like that. And so most of our waking hours until we were seven or eight was spent around all these old Indian ladies. And so that's how we came to identify as Cherokee people. That was our primary identification. We grew up knowing we were Cherokee. We didn't grow up being told, well, you're Cherokee and you're white, or you're white but you've got a little Cherokee in you. It was, you're a Cherokee person and that's who you are. And I think that maybe in most traditional communities that's how people still identify. They are because they are. You're not just part Cherokee. You either are or you're not. And I think that's a pretty common perspective here in Oklahoma. In traditional communities that have limited exposure to gay people or two-spirited people, you can still get ostracized by your own people. And that's unfortunate, and we've experienced that to a lesser degree than in society in general, but it's still there due to varying degrees of assimilation into non-Indian culture by our own people. And so even in those traditional communities, there are times and places where you'll be exposed to that sort of disharmony, that distrust, or that exclusivity. As if there's no reason for you to be there because you're gay, or there's no reason for you to be there because you're mixed that invalidation. I think that those personal experiences provide you with a desire to make those changes. And so I can definitely say in my case, the personal experiences were so frustrating that I wanted to subvert it somehow. And so I do that just by being here and exemplifying the ideas I was taught to exemplify as best I can. Fixing some of those old hurts those old wounds, those old rifts that still exist, for whatever reason, especially in smaller communities, people tend to perpetuate. It just happens, you know? And sometimes it happens for no reason at all. People are just doing it and they don't even know why. It's because they didn't stop to think or because so-and-so told them that's how it is. I've seen that happen so many times in so many different ways it's frustrating and I don't know. For whatever reason, I feel compelled to take it upon myself to be like, no, that is enough. It stops here. And I think it starts as a personal journey, and I think it ends with a sense of obligation or continues with that. It becomes bigger than yourself, and you certainly have to feel it deeply to begin there. I haven't experienced a great deal of difference between Cherokee and Creek communities, and what I've learned from my experiences with all of those people is there wasn't necessarily a place of reverence for two-spirited people, necessarily. I mean, there could have been, you know. I mean, our people all teach different things, but it was told to us that that's not how you were characterized. What's important is how you help out your family and how you take care of your people, whether it be your community, your family, your tribe, whatever circumstance how you treat the people around you and what you do to give back. That essentially defines you as a person and not who you choose as a partner. And also I've heard our medicine people say that everybody deserves a place at the fire. There is room for everybody at the fire and the fire is how we pray and how we commune. And we don't waste people. And that's not a good enough reason to throw somebody away. So that's kind of been my experience. It's more of a non-issue than a point of reverence, just a non-issue altogether. I think we're here primarily to, for one thing, to honor those who came before us, to show them that their words and their lives are not for naught, that we remember them and we honor them. And I think that any time you honor yourself, you are honoring the old ones. And if you're being true to yourself by following whatever path your heart leads you to follow, as long as it's a good path, as long as you're following that path and you're doing it in a legitimate and a genuine type of way, then it's a means by which to honor people and it's a means by which to honor the creator. 
The Creator put us here to honor the Creator and also to honor our own selves and to enrich ourselves somehow. And I feel like you can't do that if you're stifling yourself. It's part of a bigger healing that has to occur. I want future generations to know that regardless of what they hear from outsiders of any kind, that we tried. We tried and tried as best we could to preserve what's left and regain what was lost for them. Because it's theirs. It's their legacy. And we want them to have that because we find solace in that. And we find ourselves in that. And they won't find themselves in something else. That's where they'll find who they are. Because if you are Cherokee, you already are that. There's not something you do that's going to make you that. You can, can't become more Cherokee. You're born as much as Cherokee as you're ever going to be. No matter what you do, you're not going to change. Either you are or you're not, like we said earlier. And if you are, then that's not just something to be taken lightly, you know? If you are, then you should respect that. And you should do what we're doing. No. You know, you should do whatever you can do, whatever that may be, to preserve whatever's left and regain whatever's lost for those who come behind you. Because it's important to us. And it was important to those who came before us. And for that reason, we're here. And for that reason, people will follow. And that's continuity right there. I don't know how you can tell somebody to do this and actually expect them to, because it has to be something you can feel. But the most important thing to do is connect with your culture. And if you're not in a Cherokee community, it's hard as hell. And if you don't have connection to a Cherokee community, it's sometimes harder. Because if the Cherokee people, quote unquote, don't know you or your family, it's hard to connect to a culture without a community. And so when that's the case, it's very frustrating. And I think the thing is, if you really care about it, you can't lose sight of that. And you have to persist. And you have to keep going and keep trying. We love you. We love all of those of you who come after us. We're busting our asses trying to make y'all happy. Eh? No, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I say it jokingly, but I mean every bit of it. We want this kind of thing to be here long after we're gone. But that's the thing, though. You have to have that kind of foresight. You have to be able to look that far into the future and know. Because if you can see that far into the past, you can see that far into the future. If you look at how our people used to live, you know what was important to them. You can tell. And I mean, that's what we try to keep going, that feeling, that good feeling, you know? In the age of flat screen TVs and four-year-olds with cell phones, it's hard to keep it real. It is so hard. But things like this, places like this, are very convenient and very easy places for you to get a little glimpse of that, you know? And a little taste of that. Just to remind you of who you come from. Because once we leave, like Chad says, we're satellites and we go out into the world and we share all this with white people, green people, and everybody else. And it's not meant to be divisive. Two-spirit people and our two-spirit movement is not an act of divisiveness. It's an act of faith. And it's an act of love and hope and continuity and preservation of nothing but, you know? What you're hearing right now is our grandmas. This is our grandmas talking. We didn't make this shit up. This was taught to us. And this comes from two generations behind us and two generations behind that. And that's what's so special about it is somebody our age can sit here and tell you things that people who have been dead 150 years can tell you. It's the same message. We want love to be our legacy. I just can't wait till they see my pictures and we're all dressed up, and I think that's gonna be great. Cause they'll see these drag pictures and they'll be like, oh, that must be a traditional Chickasaw dress. <laughs> no girl, we did drag back then, eh? No, but I think it'll be great. My one hope for future generations is that our message is received in the feeling and sentiment with which it was intended. I fear that things will be lost in translation and I just hope there's little bits and pieces and bigger bits and bigger pieces that we have for them to work from and operate from in order to build a life that holds true to our values regardless of what it looks like. 
because that's what really makes us who we are is our values, the way we walk through this world. And I think if we can do something to make other people or encourage other people or inspire them to do the same thing and live the same way, then we've, we've done what we're here to do. Well, you know what? I want to say this too. We have a lot of gay relatives. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of gay Cherokees, and a lot of gay Creeks, and there always has been and there always will be. And anyone who sits on the tribal council and tells you something different is full of fucking shit. And I want you to believe that. I want you to know that from us, just in case you never hear it anywhere else. You heard it here. I mean that from the bottom of my heart because that's what our medicine people taught us. You guys aren't something new. You aren't some kind of spectacle we never seen. They treat us as if it's a non-issue, like I said. They treat us as if it's nothing out of the ordinary because it isn't to us. And I want to make sure that gets in there. Hey. How am I doing? All right. So. While I'm certainly not the first to make such a call, and I've made this call before, I will make it again. We must dismantle the entire constructions of gender and sexuality as part of larger work to dismantle all forms of colonial heteropatriarchy. Decolonization is impossible without centralizing women, queer and trans folks, and memory sits at the center of how we imagine what is possible for our futures. Our own indigenous genders and sexualities, through reclamation, through reimagining, through asserting our own specific understandings of what settler culture calls gender and sexuality, are part of a larger process of insurrection against colonial powers. Decolonization is a process of continuing or revitalizing our lifeways, but we must ask which lifeways are being continued and which are being ignored. Decolonization requires a re-beautification of our memories and practices in order to restore the erotic as a site of duyukta, which in Cherokee means balance and justice to our lives. Even while I'm critical and wary of the idea of tradition and how it can be used to control our behaviors, practices, and lives, I also think that continuing our lifeways, languages, songs, dances, and artistic practices is of vital importance to decolonization. The problem is not the continuation of our lifeways. The problem happens when we ignore or erase the stories and practices that don't fit into our notions of what traditional is in order to conform to colonial heteropatriarchal notions of who we are. There's nothing wrong with changing our practices. There are plenty of traditional practices that we have decided not to continue. We must ask though, which practices or stories get abandoned, not because they cause harm, but because we have so internalized the sexual and gender norms of colonial culture that we cut off parts of our memories and decide to forget ancestors and elders that make us uncomfortable in order to collude with an ongoing civilization project that once its natives subdued, normalized, and complicit, and ultimately landless and dead. There is beauty in cultural memories of loving our bodies, singing about sex, creating art that celebrates the erotic, and honoring love between people of the same gender. Why would we trade such luscious memories and practices for colonial notions of who we are? Where we have lost songs, we can create new ones. When our art is destroyed for being indecent, we can remake it. Ancestors are tricky people, so who knows? Maybe creating something new is wake, waking up what we think is lost. Maybe as we return to our memories, they return to us. Maybe all of the indigenous people in this room today are part of our ancestors dreaming us here. Stomp Dance, Two-Spirit Gathering, a giveaway poem especially for Michael St. Clair, 1952 to 2012. After the Indian drag queens and kings shake their booties to Adele and Lady Gaga, chairs are spirited away to clear the floor for Stomp Dance. 
Silver milk cans and brown yellow turtle shells are strapped to strong legs, even without the sacred fire. We spiral counterclockwise, tight as a snake, to rebalance the earth. We carry our ancestors with us, our bodies baskets that hold water. I want my sweetheart with me to see these songs water my resistance. I want his voice singing behind me. I want him to see me shake dioxyust under my blue and white skirt, my heels sore from hitting concrete instead of earth. I want my sister and mom to see these other southeastern two spirits and my nieces and nephews to hear folks talk our language like wildfire as it rolls through the Ozarks. I want Colin here to joke me through aches. Sure, each year I shell out too much money to drive to Oklahoma, but it's the only time I can shake shells or hear Laura in her rainbow finger woven sash remind us that the world began with water and earth or JC show us we have a place around the fire. I drove nine hours from Texas to get here. My muscles shake with exhaustion and pain, but I dance every dance. Imagine our spirits as splints of light locked together. The Milky Way is a white path we follow to carry earth back to our mother mounds. And when we dance, stories are unearthed we didn't know we lost. In the gravel parking lot, I talk with Mary Lou about the hot shell of grief we carry after our loved ones die and how we both find our spirits in love after loss. Usti Tewa says, those howls in the dark hills are mountain lions. Water and salt pour from my forehead as Ware teaches me to lead a song and shake at the same time. I'm clumsy and dizzy, but the dancers are patient as smoldering fire as I struggle to balance, shake and sing. There is fire in our hearts, so I try to ignore the voice in my head saying, what on earth are you doing? And listen to Ware in my right ear and not let my voice shake as I try to lead songs I've only ever sang in response while setting the rhythm for shell shakers. Some say we can't do these things, but I remember the story of Water Spider and how she carried that hot coal on her back anyway. I know the spirits of Susan and Grandmother Frida watch this is the work of our two spirit people to sing, to shake, to listen, to remember the world needs our fire if any human is to survive. We hold oceans and springs in the water of our bodies. We are part of a story that does not end with the destruction of the earth, but instead where everything is returned to us through turtle shells and songs. When we dance, manifest destiny shakes. We are the spirit of water and earth. We are an emergence of fire and turtle shells. We are the ones the world can no longer shake. Decolonization is an act of imagining. I envision a world in which all indigenous queer and trans folks speak our languages, where we all practice our life ways and teach those life ways to our children on our own lands, where the land is not poison, where our lives as humans aren't constantly at risk. I envision a world in which we have our places returned to the center of our communities, one in which the colonial powers of the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand no longer exist, and indigenous people have created other forms of governance outside of settler states. A world where our queer selves are celebrated, understood as part of our survival where women's leadership is centralized and respected, where sexual violence is unheard of, where in North America, we no longer have to fight to bring attention to missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people, where our erotic lives are simply a part of a larger reflection of who we are. This poem refers to a slur that was used in the US during the boarding or residential school experience. I know that that is common to a lot of our communities. Um, people in the US would call, would say if, if native people went back to our traditions, people would say they went back to, the, back to the blanket. And that's the name of this poem, Back to the Blanket. I am learning to take each body part back, rebeautify the space between our skin Unknit the shadows that still loom like vengeful gods in memory's doorway. 
Here we are out of reach from their hands, dripping with gold from our hills. They locked us in, away, cut our hair, burned our tongues until they were covered with landscapes of scars. We were forced to kneel before men who were not God, told to work that we might be saved from a cursed destiny made manifest with each breath. They prayed for the starvation of songs created between our skins. Come here. Let me kiss your wounds away, the mark on your back, a rigid angle of conquest. Your body does not smell like candles or scrubbing powder or centuries of terror we could not lock out. We go back to the blanket. You grasp my hips, handfuls of earth, my heart softened by the rub of your hands. Let me wrap you in ceremony, a giveaway of straining muscle, the soft, whispered stories of our flesh. Let me suck the sickness out with this old-time medicine. Make love to me until I forget their stale language. From your feet on up, you are beautiful. You weave splendor with simple tools. Feed me the traditions your body would not forget. Two-spirit people, another indigenous people, we're calling queer and trans in English, carry memories for our people. We must remake our past, honor who we are in the present, and imagine the radical and gorgeous possibilities of our futures. Our work is to rebalance an unbalanced world. If we are to survive as humans, we must. I am quite certain that part of rebalancing is to dare to love ourselves and one another through our stories, told through scholarship, through poetry, through performance, through art. Yes, I want it all back. Our lives, our languages, our lands, our songs, our plants, our children, our memories, our ancestors, our bodies, all of it. I want it all. I want us all to remember who we are. We must tell our stories and imagine our stories in order to link arms together with others to carry us out of the colonial present and into a decolonized future, our stories can reweave the world. What a thank you. <laughs>